Senator Robert C. Byrd, President Pro Tem of the United States Senate, you have a new book out called The Senate, 1789 to 1989. Why did you do this? I want my colleagues today and senators of tomorrow and the media of today and tomorrow and the American people through them to better understand this unique institution, the United States Senate and the role that it has played over these two centuries in fulfilling its responsibilities under the Constitution. We need to develop an institutional memory. So many of us who are there now don't have that institutional memory. And therefore, we're unable to accurately interpret today's events and to foresee what may happen in the future. To do these things, we need to look backward into the past. This uh, book is 800 pages long. How, how did you put it together? That is uh, what I refer to as a mini, M-I-N-I, -I, mini Manhattan Project. There are almost 300 pictures in that book. There are 39 chapters. Those 39 chapters came from 42 speeches which I delivered on the Senate floor. These speeches were carefully researched. I read them on the Senate floor. I did not put them into the record via the back door. And uh, the pictures came from many, many sources. So it took a lot of people working together to do this job. The Library of Congress, the uh, Senate uh, historian and his staff. Um, I, I've spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours on it myself. I've proofread the book five times. Know every word that went into it, every comma, exclamation point and question mark. I went over the pictures carefully and I chose the design on, on, the, uh, on the book and uh, it, it took many, many months, years on the part of a lot of people. Explain what this design is. That design shows the eagle and it's all on marbled uh, paper. It's, has ex it's an ex exquisitely bound book. The title is very simple. The Senate, 1789, 1989. Can the general public buy this? The general public can buy it from the government printing office. The government printing office has outlets all over this country. They can buy it uh, at a cost of $55 per copy. They send their check to the superintendent of documents, the government printing office, and they'll get the book. I, I make, let me hasten to say that I make no royalties. I get no benefits from the book. I would like to see it so sell because I want the contents of that book to become known around this country. I want the Senate of the United States to be better appreciated than what it is, not only by the people on the outside, but the people on the inside and the people in the media. Tell the story of how you came to give that first speech and what day was it? It was on March 21, uh, 1980. I was the majority leader. That year, I had told my colleagues that we would have no roll call votes on Fridays. The Senate would be open. We could make speeches. We could uh, carry on business by voice vote and so on. And in the gallery that day, my younger granddaughter uh, appeared with a class of students. She was one of the students and with her teacher and with her father. And I felt that in as much as there was so little going on, I should take some time and talk about the Senate so that the class would feel that it, it had been benefited by its visit. And that's how the first uh, speech came about. The following Friday, my older granddaughter was in the gallery with a class, she being one of the students, and again, she was with her teacher. Again, the same father, my same son-in-law, was there, so I felt I ought to treat her as I treated my younger granddaughter, but at the same time I wanted my, my son-in-law to hear a different speech. 
So I made another speech. I didn't have these speeches prepared. It was no problem for me to talk about the Senate for an hour or so or a day. And so that's how it came about. After the first two speeches then, uh, other senators who had read the speeches or who had heard them at that time on the squawk boxes, we didn't have television in the Senate then, uh, and officers of the Senate, the pages, other people around the Senate, the doorkeepers and so on, commented on those speeches. And they said they liked them, they would like to hear more. So that planted the idea, why don't I develop a history of the Senate? It will take a long time, I can pro possibly uh, deliver a hundred speeches on it. And so that's how it came about. So over the, over the next uh, seven to eight years, I delivered speeches on the history of the Senate so that there are circa 100 speeches that I've made. Now there'll be a second volume. The material's already there because I've already delivered the speeches. There will very likely be a third volume uh, because the there's enough material and maybe even a fourth volume. Did you deliver all your speeches Everyone. without, without uh, uh, copy in front of you? Oh no, no, no. I had to going from the first two, which were extemporaneous because the circumstances just came about uh, without foreknowledge, once I had decided that I was going to develop the history of the Senate through a series of lectures on the Senate floor, then I began to, to read from prepared uh, speeches. Where's this picture from? That was a picture that was taken at a uh, conference uh, in room 207, just off the Senate floor, President Reagan came to the conference that day. He had been newly elected, and so uh, we had a joint meeting of Democrats and Republicans in that, it's the Mansfield room, 207, and uh, the camera caught me looking over the President's uh, uh, head. 300 photographs. And I think I've heard this from so many people pick this book up. It's one of the most handsome books that people have ever seen. The paper, the printing, who did it? The government printing office, that's a Senate document. The government printing office, and it's, it has been authorized, the printing of it has been authorized by the Senate via a Senate resolution. The, the uh, government printing office uh, did the work on that the government printing office is not accustomed to doing this kind of work. So uh, there were a lot of bugs in it for a while. And I went over the galley proofs, as I say, five times. And finally, it was put into to shape. And then it was contracted out by the government printed printing office. And an excellent publisher uh, uh, and binder actually did the final piece. Who helped you in the Senate itself? In the Senate itself, the uh, Senate historian and his staff, and my own staff um, helped me to a considerable extent, but I, I for the most part, uh, as far as in the Senate, other than the Senate <coughs> historian's staff, uh, I for the most part then did, did about all the work. What's the reaction you're getting? Excellent. Uh, senators are, are exuberant about it. Uh, everybody who has seen it loves it, wants a copy of it. And people who have received it uh, comment uh, very favorably with respect to it. Do you have any idea how many uh, copies the government printing office had printed originally? I believe about uh, 10,000 or 11,000 copies. Copies have gone to all of the depository libraries throughout the United States. Those that are on the uh, government printing offices list uh, have, received, have received them. I have sent other copies to various uh, colleges and universities, law professors, uh, where I've had access to the names because I want that book to get exposure uh, where it b will be most appreciated. Uh, there are people who would like to have the book. It's limited in number as of now, but there can be a second or third printing or f additional printing. But there are people who will look at it, look at the pictures, look at the index to see if their names are in the index, and then they'll put it on the shelf. It's a beautiful piece. 
But I want people to see it who will read it, who will teach it in their classes. I want the media especially to absorb it so that they will get their facts straight. And I want senators to read it today and as I say senators 50 years from now so that they will have a deeper appreciation of this very unique institution which is larger than the sum of its 100 parts. This picture comes from what era? Uh, that is a picture that was taken uh, when uh, Mr. Nixon was uh, uh, either a senator or vice president. It's a strange picture. It has only Mr. Nixon there, and he is seated in, in, near the back row. I've never really understood uh, why that picture was taken, but it's, it's quite, a, quite a unique picture. That's from he, his he is seated in the back area of the Senate, and he is, uh, no, no, he isn't. He is seated at the, at the front, yes, he's seating, he is seated, ah, yes. He is seated in his chair, the vice president's uh, chair, the presiding officer's seat. The, the chamber is empty. There are a few people in one gallery here. There's a, a tourist. There's a doorkeeper up here. And uh, the vice president is sitting there in the presiding officer's chair, and he's looking back like this to someone who has a camera. Do you have a favorite part of this book, favorite story? Oh, there's so many favorite stories in that book. Or a favorite senator in history. I have several favorite senators. Of course, uh, the great trio, uh, Webster, Calhoun, and Clay, would, have, would occur to every uh, student of history. Uh, Thomas Hart Benton. Uh, senator Russell. I'll have a chapter on the late Senator Richard Russell in the next uh, volume. And uh, Senator... Uh, and Vice President Aaron Burr. Uh, I'll have a chapter on him. There are other favorite senators, but uh, I think the ones I've named are probably typical. I'm looking for uh, the Compromise of 1850. Uh, I think I'll get it here in just a second, because there, there is a photograph in here of uh, Daniel Webster. Uh, when did the, do you happen to remember when photographs were first taken of senators? I don't, I don't remember. Uh, let me see if I, I, for some reason, I can't find the uh, Compromise of 1850, but talk about Daniel Webster. I will find that. Wh what about Daniel Webster do you like in, in history? Well, Daniel Webster, of course, we admire him. He was a, a great orator. We have to keep in mind, however, that in those days, uh, senators had more time to reflect, to think, to compose their speeches, to write their speeches. Webster was a good, he, he was a good, a good writer. Uh, and they, they could memorize their speeches. And then after they spoke them, they could take the transcript uh, to their boarding houses. Few of them had homes in the area at that, uh, here at that time. They uh, could take their trans the transcripts of the speeches to the boarding houses and work on them, edit them so that what we read is uh, not necessarily the speech as it was exactly given. This is Daniel Webster for our audience. Yes, that is Dan Daniel Webster. I have several pictures, I believe. In you there. think he would have been as, as uh, great an orator today uh, with, compared to, to uh, what we read about him? Compared oh, to the senators of today? Oh, I think Webster would have been a great orator in any day. Um, but times are so different now. We, men don't have, uh, Webster would not have had the time now to reflect and to think and to write. And I would assume that he memorized uh, a good many of his, his speeches as men and great orators did in those days. Henry Clay, you mentioned him. Clay was a great orator. He was a uh, He was a remarkable man, a tremendous politician. He became Speaker of the House on the first day that he became a member of the House. And uh, he was... Um, Did that happen today? <laughs> no, I don't think it would happen today. What about Calhoun? We've got a picture here of him. Calhoun... Uh, 
was a fiery uh, speaker. He spoke at the rate of about 180 words a minute. Um, each of these three was somewhat unique in his own right. And each brought qualities to his speeches that perhaps uh, the others may not have. We spoke of Webster a moment ago. Webster was on the payroll of, of uh, Mr. Biddle's bank. And uh, during one of the great debates in the Senate with respect to the National Bank, Webster took the occasion to write to Biddle and to remind him that he had not received his check and asked the question, do you wish to retain me uh, longer? Now, that was an e egregious breach of ethics in our day for one in the Senate to be on the payroll of uh, an institution about which the legislation is being acted upon and debated on the Senate floor. We'll go back to more modern times. Here's a photograph of two gentlemen that used to be leaders in the Senate, and uh, the gentleman right here, they just, I just saw a story in the paper about him today. Who's, who are these two men? Senator Mansfield and Senator Hugh Scott. Uh, Senator Mansfield was the majority leader at that time. Senator Scott was the minority leader. They were the first to go to uh, China after President Nixon had opened the doors and drawn down the barriers. Those two senators went to China. Of course, Mr. Mansfield had been in China for many years in, in his earlier life. So that he went on to be ambassador to Japan. For yes, he years. did. Yes. He served as majority leader for 16 years. 16 years, the longest that any senator has been majority leader. Where did you work with him closely? I worked very closely with him. I was secretary to the Democratic Conference for four years, worked right at his elbow. I was the majority whip for six years, worked right at his elbow. And I spent as much time during those 10 years in those two offices, uh, as much time on the floor as I spent uh, when I became majority leader and then minority leader and back to minor majority leader. I did practically all of the floor work for Mr. Mansfield while he was leader. What's this picture? That uh, is a picture that was taken at a time when we were meeting with Mr. Nixon down in the, uh, down not in the White House, but in the old executive office building. I forget what we were discussing at that time. You can see my hair was not <laughs> gray as it is now, but it was black. There was uh, Senator Griffin, who was then, I believe, the whip. Right and there's there. Mr. Nixon there, and there's, um, Jerry Ford. Jerry Ford, he was at that yeah. time in, in the House. And there's Hugh Scott, who was the minority leader at that time. Is that Carl Albert? I can't, I'm looking at this. Oh, here he is, right here. I Speaker believe, of the House. I believe that's yeah. Carl Albert. I can't tell exactly from here, but I believe that's right. What, uh, what do you remember about this period? About the period when uh, Mr. Nixon was president. And when you possibly were in this office and those gentlemen uh, were in the leadership. Well, that was before the uh, problems arose with regard to Watergate. Nixon uh, was a president whom I liked uh, because he understood how to work with Congress. He had been in both houses. And I had, a, I had a very fond feeling for Mr. Nixon, even though he later had problems. And I prepared at that time to be active in the uh, impeachment trial, which never, never finally occurred. Another picture of uh, Senator Mansfield. What was his style compared to yours as a majority leader? Well, as the book will point out, uh, and other people are quoted in it, uh, in answer to that particular question, so I'll let them answer the question. It was a kind of a laid back style. Uh, Mr. I served under both Mr. Johnson, when he, he was majority leader, and Mr. Mansfield. Mr. Johnson was the hard driving type, the type who would twist arms, could Joe threaten, uh, plead, and drive. Mr. Mansfield was just the opposite. He, was, he believed in letting every senator uh, go his own way, make up his own mind. He didn't attempt to 
twist arms. Uh, I did the floor work. Mr. Mansfield was back in his office reading the press papers and books and so on. So they had their different styles and both were good leaders. That's a picture that was taken in the Rose Garden uh, and Mr. Johnson at the time he was president and there's uh, the late Speaker McCormick who was there, the late Hale Boggs, Congressman Boggs, and uh, Carl Albert who was uh, Speaker at that time. Mr. McCormick was then the uh, whip, I believe, in the House. And then there's George Smathers, uh, uh, who was then the senator from Florida. There's the late Hubert Humphrey. And there's Mike Mansfield with his back turned, his head turned. And Mike was walking away. And that picture <coughs> was given to Senator Man Mansfield by the late President Kennedy, uh, who wrote on it something to the effect to Mike Mansfield, who knows uh, when, when to go, and so it looks as though Mike is walking away from the, from the center of conversation. Who, are, who is the uh, new new arrival here in this picture? Well, now that is uh, the late Senator Dirksen. Senator Mansfield was majority leader. Senator Dirksen was minority leader. Senator Dirksen was the greatest orator that I've ever heard in my time on Capitol Hill, which spans now going on 37 years on Capitol Hill. Martin Dyes, the late Martin Dyes, representative in the House, who was chairman of the Un-American Activities Committee, was also a great, a great orator. But there are those two men, the two leaders. Mike Mansfield worked very closely with Dirksen. There was a ex an excellent rapport between the two. And for that reason, uh, we were able to enact the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964 because Dirksen, uh, through his um, massive influence, into the fray and helped to bring about the, the, the cloture. Uh, Dirksen was probably the most influential man in the Senate at that time. Why was that? Well, he, uh, he, was, uh, he was an excellent politician. He knew how to, to he, and he, was, he was excellent. If there was any senator who could, who could change another senator's mind with a speech, it was Everett Dirksen. There is a picture. Uh, Mike Mansfield and and myself, uh, he was talking with me. We were probably going over some whip check. Uh, I was the majority whip at that time. And we were probably counting votes or some such. What's the whip do? Well, I'll tell you what I did. Uh, I was When I was majority leader, I did uh, practically all the floor work, which uh, is not hasn't been the case with other whips. But I, I stayed on the floor all the time. And in those days, when I was majority whip, and later when I first became majority leader, we had in the Senate uh, the late Senator Jim Allen of Alabama, who was an excellent senator, fine man, an excellent parliamentarian, knew how to use the rules and the precedents, and he had the guts to take a stand if he had to stand alone. And so we had a lot of parliamentary battles, and Senator Allen, uh, perfected the art of the post-cloture filibuster. We've, all, we've had the filibuster for many decades, but the art of the post-cloture filibuster, the filibuster that occurs after cloture is invoked, and that's, uh, has, that has proved to be <laughs> a more difficult filibuster than the pre-cloture filibuster. Uh, the battles were between Senator Allen and me. I was the majority leader. I would act for the for the, uh, I was the majority whip. I would act for the majority leader. Then as I became majority leader, those battles would occur between Jim Allen and me, the parliamentary battles on the floor. Here's a uh, photograph from the 1964 signing of the Civil Rights Act. And there are some, uh, some new faces here. Here's Senator Dirksen, Senator Humphrey, Charlie Halleck, who was he? Charlie Halleck was the, uh, uh, leader in the House, the, the uh, leader of the minority. And the gentleman next to him, is that Emanuel Seller? I'm looking at it backwards, so I can't. I can't uh, see from here. Like I, see, Seller, I, I believe. see Tom Kekel over there behind that. This gentleman uh, right here. California, yes. Senator Kekel, there's Hubert Humphrey. What did you think of Lyndon Johnson? Well, Lyndon Johnson was, uh, had a unique uh, uh, drive about him. Uh, he, he would simply twist arms and 
there was just, it was difficult to say no to Lyndon Johnson. I'm one of the few who ever said no to him. But uh, Lyndon Johnson probably couldn't operate as he did today in today's Senate. What did, when did you say no to him? Uh, when he uh, called me on one occasion, I can remember very carefully, he called me and asked me to, to um, support the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And I told him that I could not vote for it. And uh, there were some parts of it I could support, some I could not. And he, but he started out like this. He said, how bad do you want that judgeship? And I had sent to, to the uh, Justice Department and to the White House the name of a, a man in West Virginia whom I wanted to see appointed as a federal district judge. So Mr. Johnson called me on the phone. He was president of the United States then. How bad do you want that judgeship? Well, I said, I want it. Well, he said, uh, he doesn't qualify. Send us another name. I said, why doesn't he qualify? He said, he's too old. How old does he have to be? He said, he's past 60. I said, well, he wasn't 60 when I sent his name down. And I said, do you remember, Mr. President, when you ran, when you were running for president, I went to the convention as a delegate from West Virginia, an openly announced supporter of Lyndon B. Johnson. And I, uh, I was 100% for Lyndon B. Johnson. I wasn't 80%, I wasn't 90%, I was 100%. And I uh, announced it from the steeple tops. I didn't run, hide under a rock. And I said that's the same way I feel about this man who, whom I want to be judged. I'm not 80%, not 90, I'm 100% for him. Well, we went around and around like that for about a half hour, and then he asked me to vote for cloture. Well, I said, I'm not going to vote for cloture. I'm going to be, I'm going to be with Dick Russell on that. And he said, well, you love me as well as you do Dick Russell, don't you? That, that's the way he would talk, you know. You love me as well as you do Dick Russell. I said, well, I do. But uh, I said, I'm going to be with Dick Russell. Well, he said, why don't I send you on a trip somewhere? Why don't I ask you to go on a trip somewhere, halfway around the world? You can come back and make a big report on it and, and look good to your constituents and all that, but you'll be away when that cloture vote occurs on the filibuster. And I said, no, Mr. President, you remember whenever uh, you were majority leader and I first came to the Senate, you put me on the Appropriations Committee, and I can go anywhere in the world I want at any time as a member of the Appropriations Committee. So the upshot of it was, finally, as we went around, haggled around for a half hour, uh, and I would not support cloture. Uh, he said, okay, Bob. He said, uh, I still love you, and your nomination will be up first next week. So he sent the nomination on up there that I wanted. I don't know that a lot in our audience that their followers of Senator Dirksen have ever seen a, a picture, uh, either this young or this old, depending on how you look at it. Where did you find a picture like this? Do you know? Well, those pictures have come from so many places, it will indicate right underneath there, the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. Some came from uh, Jimmy Carter's library, some came from the Martin Luther King library, some came from my own office, some came from um, libraries in other parts of the country. What made, and, w and we'll move on after this, uh, what, do you think Senator Dirksen acquired his oratorical ability, or did, the whole time that you knew him in the Senate, did he have a good speaking technique. Oh yes, at all time I knew him he did. The book will say, will tell that he uh, acquired, <laughs> acquired this, uh, this uh, ability. First singing in the church choir, it helped him to develop his voice. And he also uh, got involved in writing plays and in acting, being the actor in some of the plays. He had a natural voice, and he had a natural flamboyant way about him. He, he clowned always, he acted with, with, with great theatrics, and the press galleries would always fill when they knew Dirksen was going to speak. And he had a marvelous mind, he was a, he was a big man, uh, fairly big man physically, but a big man mentally, and, and he had a soul and a heart. For those who have just joined us, uh, we're halfway through talking with Senator Robert C. Byrd of West Virginia, currently the chairman of the Appropriations Committee and the president pro tem of the United States Senate, and author of this book, Senate, 1789 to 1989, addresses uh, on the history of the United States Senate, 
available at the government printing office for $55, and we'll have that address on the screen as the program goes on, definitely at the end of the program. It's the U.S. Government Printing Office, Washington, D.C., and the zip code is 20402. I don't know that you know this, but if you buy more than one copy, can you get them cheaper? Not that I know of. I know. There are, here's a picture, there are three Senate office buildings. One of them named after Senator Dirksen, one of them named after Senator Russell, and the other one named after this gentleman. Who is he, and why did you name one of your buildings after him? That's Senator Phil Hart. He was in the class of 1958, of which I was a member. Senator Phil Hart took on some of the great issues of that day. He was thought of and spoken of as the conscience of the Senate. He often went against uh, what some of the powerful political interests in his state would have been for, or he went for some, uh, I, uh, issues on issues that they would have been against. He demonstrated a tremendous amount of courage. He died of cancer uh, d during his time in the Senate. And so th I have his picture there. I have Senator Howard Cannon's picture there. Uh, and then there's Senator Eugene McCarthy, there's Senator Vance Hartke. All those were members of the 1958 class, and I have a whole chapter on that class. I'm the last remaining member of that class. And I, I, the class had some very remarkable senators in it. And they uh, went on to become chairman of various committees, and as such, were highly instrumental in the passage of a very important legislation. What do you remember about Senator Hartke, of, uh, Democrat of Indiana? Well, he was uh, very instrumental in uh, education measures. Uh, uh, I was thinking about Muskie. Senator Muskie's picture is in there, too. And Muskie was, page. was in that class, and he was very instrumental in, uh, in the passage of a lot of environmental legislation. There's Muskie's picture, Senator Muskie. Senator Johnson is lauding uh, Senator Muskie in the background of that picture. Uh, Senator Muskie then went on to be Secretary of State, but Senator Muskie, when he was in the Senate, he uh, was uh, the author of uh, environmental legislation, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act. Are you surprised that you're the only one of the class of 1958 left? Well, I guess I may be a little surprised about it. Here's a more of a cartoon uh, of a number of familiar faces. Do you recognize as any of these? I know that... Yes, I recognize a good many of those pictures. Uh, there's, there is... Uh, is this Senator Russell? Yes, that's Senator Russell, and then there's Senator Dirksen just behind him. Uh, <coughs> Senator Humphrey's in the picture. Senator Bob yeah, Kerr is in the picture. Senator Wayne Morris is in the picture. Senator uh, Wayne Morris right here. Yes, and uh, Senator Keating. Kenneth Keating. Way over here. Yes. How can someone who is interested in the Senate and teaching it use this book? What's the best way to use it if you're a teacher? Well, if I were you know, I'm not a teacher, therefore I, I, don't, I don't suppose I should attempt to answer that question except to say if I were a teacher, I would do exactly what I've done with this book. I would, as you can see, I've read it again since it was published, and it was published in February. We launched it in February, so that hasn't been very long ago, but I've read it again since that time, as you can see from all the underlining in it. Uh, many well, see, people. Let me. Uh, this is. Uh, it's a little bit awkward, and and I want. I want to show the audience because, you do this. We we once before talked about uh, how you read the book of precedents. Yes. Senate precedents every year and go through and underline it. I'm going to fold the pages here, and uh, and this is your copy. How yes. many times have you done this? This is the. Well, as you can see, I've read the entire book. Uh, since it was published in the last six weeks, I've read it. I've underlined it, and in the margins, I've written little notes uh, as to the highlights of the paragraphs. And in that way, I can quickly find some of the, uh, the highlights that I wish to look up at a particular time, aside from looking in the index. By the way, is all the information that is in your book, 
it is, is it all available in the congressional record if somebody wanted to go that route to get the most of it there in your, in your speeches you gave on the Senate floor? They could do, they could do that. Uh, they could do that. However, these, since I made the speeches, some of them have been combined. In other words, there are 42 speeches that have been put into 39 chapters here. And some of them have been brought up to date as well. What's this picture? Picture over there is a picture of my receiving my law degree from the late President John F. Kennedy. Uh, he addressed uh, the American University uh, Law School commencement in uh, 1963. And upon that occasion, I received my law, law degree, and I had the great honor of, of receiving it from him. Should you have to have a law degree to serve in the United States Senate? No. Uh, matter of fact, there have been great senators who, who were not who were not lawyers, but most members of that body have been lawyers. I learned years ago when I was starting out in both houses of the West Virginia legislature that the lawyers seemed to be the movers and shakers, and they knew most. They knew more about parliamentary procedure, and I decided I should try to get a law degree. Not that I ever expected to become a lawyer but that I, I just wanted to be a better, a better servant. Uh, I wanted to make myself more able. Do you recognize this picture? That picture, yes, that's, uh, I believe that's the Madame Jean Kai-shek shaking hands with the late Clifford Case and Mike Mansfield's at the table. Senator Dick Russell is there. Senator Russell back here? Back there, and that's Senator Dirksen at the, the left, and then I believe Senator Sparkman is just the other side of the Madame. Let's see what we have here on the next page. That's a picture of uh, President Eisenhower uh, having a little, having a little fun and uh, badinage and persiflage with the late Speaker Rayburn, and I believe that's Senator Russell Long there in the center. Yes, Oops. Senator Russell Long right, right in the center. Uh, I don't recognize the others in the picture. If this is 1958, uh, I don't know. Did you say 58? I can't see it from where I am. Um, but General Eisenhower is present 52 to uh, 60. Where were you at that point? Uh, I was uh, in the House. Uh, I went to the House uh, in 1953, January, when uh, Mr. Eisenhower became president. And I was in the Senate uh, the last two years of Mr. Eisenhower's second term. This so photograph uh, includes uh, Sam Rayburn and Joe Martin. Who were they? Uh, Sam Rayburn was a, uh, at the time that picture was taken, you see, when I first went to the House, Joe Martin was the majority leader that first year. The Republicans had taken control in the 1952 elections. And so Joe Martin was the speaker, and Mr. Rayburn was the majority leader. But then Bill the Nolan, who was he? Bill Nolan was uh, the majority leader in the Senate. If this, these four gentlemen were here today, would the Senate be different than it is? No, they wouldn't operate like they did today if they were here in the Senate. How would they change? Well, the, ch the makeup of the Senate has changed. When uh, Lyndon Johnson was majority leader, the great issue of that day was the civil rights issue. And Speaker Russell and the Southern Bloc constituted a homogeneous bloc. And all of the old Confederate states of America were represented by Democratic senators. Did you, rec did you respect this man? Oh, the late Senator Richard Russell, yes. I Why? I did very much. Because he was, he was uh, a man who revered the Senate. And he was keenly astute to its rules and precedents and traditions. What do and you think he would think of television in the Senate today? Well, he probably wouldn't have, wouldn't have gone for it. This photograph. That is a photograph of, uh, oh yes, John Bricker. Uh, he pushed the Bricker Amendment, and in, in, in him with that, in that picture is, uh, I don't recognize those other persons. Well, you remember what the Bricker Amendment was? Yes, it had to do with uh, executive agreements and treaties 
and uh, um, it, it almost, a substitute for it almost passed, but for the vote of the late Senator Harley Kilgore of West Virginia, one of my predecessors, who cast a deciding vote against it. That's a picture that was taken on the White House steps when uh, Mr. Eisenhower was, er that was very early in his presidency, and uh, they have Margaret Sullivan there with him. I'm beside her as a new member of the House, Sam Friedel beside him, and uh, I see uh, Jack Brooks in the picture, Lee Metcalf, and Bob Mollahan of West Virginia, and some others whom I can't recognize from here. What do you hope, uh, when we first started talking about all this, you, you said you hope that uh, press and students and all will read this, and why is it, what does it matter? Well, it matters a great deal. Uh, let me explain. The people in the media need to know the history of the United States Senate, if they're going to accurately report on it and interpret today's events, accurately interpret today's events uh, in the light of history. For example, recently, following the Tower nomination uh, vote, I heard a very uh, uh, fine uh, news uh, reporter uh, make the statement on a, on a TV show. She, she was on a panel. She said, the Senate will never be the same again. Well, that reflected to me a lack of institutional memory. The Senate's already the same again. I mean, those things come and go. That's why we need to read the history. We could see that in uh, President Tyler's time, for example, in 1843, Tyler sent in the name of uh, Caleb Cushing to be Secretary of the Treasury. And it was on the March, March the 3rd. In those days, the, the uh, Congress wound up its work on March 3rd, and a new Congress convened on March 4. And presidents were wont to come up to the Capitol and sit in the vice president's room, which was where the Republican leaders' offices now are, just across from the old Senate chamber, and send in their last minute nominations and sign bills. And Tyler sent in the name of Caleb Cushing to be Secretary of the Treasury. It was rejected by the Senate by a vote of 27 to 19. Tyler immediately sent it back in to be Secretary of the Treasury. It was again rejected by a vote of 27 to 9. He immediately sent Cushing's name back in to be Secretary of the Treasury. The third time it was rejected by a vote of 29 to 2. But that wasn't all of it. Uh, Tyler's uh, nominee for a minister to Brazil was rejected. His minister to, to France was rejected. His nominee for Secretary of War was rejected. His nominee for Secretary of the Navy was rejected. His nominee for Supreme Court was rejected. And yet the Senate got over it. It's the same thing can be said with respect to the imbroglio in which Senator Foote of Mississippi drew a gun on Senator Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri on the Senate floor in the old Senate chamber. Now you talk about fireworks. <laughs> that may be a pun, but you talk about bitterness and anger and passion. All of these were a part of the Senate in the days in which they, they were arguing over abolitionist legislation and petitions and, and uh, the free states versus slave states. Deep passions. And Foote drew a gun on Thomas Hart Benton. And the Senate has been the same since. And there was Charles Sumner, who was beaten with a cane by a member of the House as Sumner sat at his desk in the old Senate chamber because he had made a vitriolic speech uh, titled The Crime of Kansas. And he was sitting at his desk franking out this speech to his constituents. And Preston Brooks, a relative of uh, Andrew Butler, who had been the subject of Sumner's vitriolic invective uh, came in and said, I, uh, you, you spoke, uh, I, I, I want to settle a little matter with you. you. I didn't like what you had to say about my kinsman. And he proceeded to beat 
Charles Sumner with a cane, and Sumner in rising, he was a large man, he ripped up his desk, and he was out of the Senate for about three years. There have been things like that happen. Clay uh, fought a duel with uh, John Randolph, Representative Randolph of Virginia, and uh, Clay shot a hole through Randolph's coat, whereupon Randolph shot up into the air with his pistol, threw his gun down, and shook hands with Clay and said, you owe me a coat. Uh, so it, it kind of makes one laugh when people uh, get the idea that because we have some passionate arguments and considerable bitterness over a nomination that the Senate will never be the same again, you know. That this, if one reads that book there, one will see that the Senate has been here a long time, 200 years, and its roots go far deeper than 1789. I want you to talk about these, this right. set of photographs. Um, George Thames of the New York Times took them, uh, and there's a whole series of them. Why'd you, why'd you include these? Well, Theodore Francis Green, uh, I think, was about 90 years old at the time that picture was taken. He was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate. And um, one of the newspapers uh, had, had recommended that Green uh, give up the chairmanship. And Green was about to give it up, and so stated. Well, Lyndon Johnson wanted Green to carry out, carry out his decision, but he wanted to make Green feel that uh, Lyndon Johnson, who was the leader, would like for him to stay. So uh, that's a picture following a meeting of the committee when Johnson had ostensibly tried to prevail on Green to stay on as chairman. and. Green had go, said he would like to go off in the next room and think about it just for a few minutes. So Johnson followed him out into that room. So beginning here at the top, you see Johnson talking with Green. Then Johnson gets a little closer. Then Johnson gets a little closer. Then Johnson's a little closer. And Gene, Green backs up and gets against the table. And here uh, Johnson has Green back over the table. And here Johnson is right up in Green's face with that, with that, uh, with that typical pressure action that Johnson could bring to bear, talking right up under your chin, looking you in the eye, and he, it's a series, it's just like a, a, an old silent picture film, and it shows Green backing away. Anybody in the Senate today deal with his or her colleagues this way? No, and Johnson couldn't deal with them today, I keep saying that. Johnson could not deal with them today, we have a different type in the Senate uh, there today, a different type of senator. And in those days, as I said, Johnson had uh, the Southern Bloc, the, all the senators from the Confederate states were Democrats. Today, many of those old Confederate states are represented by Republicans. So Johnson would not have had that solid Southern Bloc backing that he had then. Who are these three gentlemen? That, is, that picture there is uh, President Taft. In the uh, middle. In the middle. and. Uh, on this side is uh, his son, who later became a senator and one of the great senators, uh, whose pictures are in the medallions in the Senate reception room. And on the other side is another Robert Taft. Is, is that the uh, Robert Taft that became a senator, the son of? No, no, that not the same one. No, that 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 uh, son did not did not become a senator. This one became. Um, the leader of the Republicans in the Senate and sought uh, on more than one occasion to secure the nomination for president. On, this, uh, on the other side of the page here, we have a, I don't know what you would call this, but it's Robert uh, Taft again. Why uh, isn't he the only, I don't know, you describe it, the, the, the Taft Memorial that's up on the, uh, on the Capitol. Why, why is that there? And could that happen today? Well, Taft was, uh, he was a powerful force in the Senate. He was a, a great uh, leader of his party. He came near being president upon, at least he sought to get the nomination. And uh, he was a very influential uh, senator. And uh, he was chosen by a committee of senators as one of the all-time uh, five great senators. And those five senators 
are their pictures are in the medallions in the uh, re in the reception room just off the Senate floor. What what, may, what what did uh, his colleagues think was so great about him? Well, the things that I that I have outlined. He was a very influential senator. He was. Uh, was he a good orator? No, he was not an excellent orator. Um, but he was a powerful force. Was he tough? He was tough. Uh, many people thought he was arrogant, uh, he was erudite, he was effective as a leader, and uh, he was a statesman. This picture. That is a picture of uh, McCarthy, Senator McCarthy and uh, Senator Tidings. Senator Miller Tidings. Tidings. Yes. Whose son, Joe Tidings, also came to the Senate. Yes. Yes, and Miller Tidings uh, lost the election in Maryland. Uh, as the book will explain, he lost to a man who was a protege of McCarthy. And as the book states, McCarthy's diatribes and, and vindictive accusations uh, helped to bring about the defeat of Tidings. Where were you when Senator McCarthy was in the Senate? I was in the House. What did you think of him? I don't remember too much about what I thought uh, about him at that time. But I saw him from a great distance at that time. I was a new member of the House and serving in the House. I served there three terms. I wasn't a, a close observer of the Senate in those days. What's this photo? Here. The old Senate chamber, and on a, I think I remember reading where it was a day that, for some reason or other, you, you couldn't uh, get into the Senate chamber itself. Is it? Oh, that yes, that's the old Senate chamber, and they were meeting at that time to uh, debate the NATO agreement, and that's President Barclay. Uh, Alvin Barclay, that was yeah. vice president at the time, right here. Yes, mm -hmm. and. Uh, was this the permanent home of the Senate at that point, or were they just using it for temporary? No, they were using it at that time <clears throat> while they were renovating the, the, the chamber in which we now sit. The members moved into the chamber which we now use and on January the 4th, uh, 1859. There were 64 members of the Senate at that time. But I can remember coming here as a Boy Scout when they were renovating the Senate chamber that we now, we're now in. At that time, then, the Senate senators met in the old Senate chamber. Could the Senate <coughs> legally meet anywhere it wanted to? Well, the Senate uh, can meet if it, if it passes a resolution to meet uh, somewhere else it can do it. It has met in the old Senate chamber. On a, on a few occasions, the president convene, can convene under the, under the United States Constitution. The president can convene the Senate anywhere he wants to. If there were an emergency, for example, he could convene the Senate uh, on Spruce Knob over in West Virginia. It would be hard for the Soviets to get there with a battalion or 20 battalions because those mountaineers over there are like those Afghans. They Senator Vandenberg. Senator, Van, Senator Vandenberg was a, a great Republican senator, a great statesman. He was really the spokesman for the chief spokesman for the Republicans at that time in the area of foreign policy. He was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. Senators smoke like they used to today? No, no they don't. Any reason? Oh, I think it's about like uh, you see everywhere else. Uh, Smoking is not as uh, prevalent as it was. It certainly isn't with senators. These three gentlemen, do you recognize them? Yes, there is um, Senator uh, uh, Connolly, Tom Connolly, uh, who was also chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee at one time, and there's Senator Vandenberg and uh, the late uh, Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles. He was Secretary of State when I was in the House of Representatives. I was on the Foreign Affairs Committee at that time. So. Anybody else, we, we only have a short time left and uh, we haven't even begun to look at all the pictures. Now you say there are 300 pictures. Yes. 
800 pages. Yes. When you read this book, by the way, how do you do? Do you read it right straight through at one sitting, or do you come back to it every day? No, I read it through. I've read it through. I go back to it many times to certain areas and refresh my, my memory. I also, on the occasion of reading it through, looked for any possible errors that I may have failed to, to pick up in my five, five proofreadings. Well, how many people do you think overall had something to do with putting this book out that work in the Senate? Oh, not more than a half dozen, I would say. We uh, really put a good time book. in on uh, are, are there any other senators today sitting in the United States Senate that have as much interest in history as you do? Oh, there are senators who have interest in history. I'm not sure that any, any, any of the senators have as much interest in the Senate history as I do. I hope there will be others, and I hope that this book will spark a great deal of interest. My uh, interest in history goes beyond the history of the Senate. I have a great interest in the history of England. Uh, and the reason, there are several reasons. One, it's very interesting, and secondly, we're related uh, to our English forebears, but for the most part, I'm interested in the history of England because of its influence on our own history and on our own parliamentary uh, procedures and on our own constitution. Uh, we value uh, the legislative power of the purse, those of us who are members of the, of the Congress. And Englishmen fought and shed their blood uh, to establish the control over the purse by Parliament. And uh, many of our phrases and clauses in our own Constitution uh, have roots in English events. And uh, it is for that reason that I like to know as much as I can about those roots, because then I can better evaluate our own Constitution. And we must remember that the men who wrote the American Constitution uh, were fresh in the English experience. Senator Byrd, we're about out of time. Here's a color photograph in the book of what looks like to be uh, at the old Senate chamber. Yes. And I'm going to show our audience the front cover of this book, and thank you very much for joining us. Book available at the U.S. Government Printing Office, Washington, D.C. Author is Senator Robert Byrd, and it's called The Senate. 1989, I mean 1789 to 1989. Thank you very much. Thank for you very much. Thank you.